Well, uh, this summer, if you've been uh, with us a little while, you know, there's no, no series. We're just looking at some hot spots uh, in, in various parts of the Bible. And so uh, this morning, um, I picked a passage out of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6. And we're going to be looking at the armor of God. Now, the armor of God is a, a topic that I have heard about since I was about, you know, four years old. You know, you're in your Sunday school and you make your crafts about the armor of God. You're cutting out the pieces of armor and you're piecing them together. So it's interesting that this is a super familiar topic to Christians. And yet, at the same time, when you actually look at the passage, there's a whole lot here to really sink your teeth into and grab a hold of. So this morning, some of the questions that we're going to be looking at are, you know, what do I do about my thought life? Um, as a Christian, you know, I'm eager, I'm sincere, I want to grow in Christ, and yet I'm getting the thoughts. I'm getting the thoughts. What do I do about those silly, silly thoughts that plague me? And then, is there an active enemy? You know, if you look from uh, Romans to Revelation at the epistles to the New Testament church, the enemy is seldom spoken of. I mean, you can count on two hands the major passages where the enemy is talked about compared with pages and pages of exposition about who Jesus is and, and what he's done for us and, and our role in response. And so you hear very little about the enemy. And so today's a, a unique day in that we're going to look into God's word and see, you know, is there an active enemy? And if so, what's he up to? What's he doing? And is the enemy, I mean, is he just out there, you know, after the Billy Graham types? You know, I mean, does he care about me and what's going on in my life? And apparently the book of Revelation actually says that the enemy accuses us day and night. So you're already seeing what the enemy does. He's the accuser of the brethren, that's us, day and night. So that means relentless, doesn't stop. Well, what could he possibly accuse us about? Well, he can think of a few things. So what is he up to, and what do I do in response? So this morning we're in Ephesians 6. We're going to look at the armor of God. And the first thing that, uh, that Paul really shouts from the rooftops here is it's God's strength. Now watch this verse. You know, I, I've often noted that it's, it's peculiar how we talk about strong Christians. Have you ever noticed how much we talk, oh, he's a strong Christian, he's a believer, he's a strong believer, he's, he's strong. And we tend to sort of throw that lingo around, talking about someone as if they are strong, and yet not one single time in the New Testament do we ever find Christians being told that they are strong, or that they should try to be strong. In fact, what we see here is, be strong in the Lord. Now, do you remember what Paul said about strength? What Paul said about strength is, I, I don't have any. I glory in my weaknesses. I glory in my weaknesses so that the strength of someone else can take over. So that the power of Christ rests on me. So here's the idea then about Christian growth that is totally revolutionary for me. I should not expect to get stronger and stronger and stronger in my Christian life. If, my, if I set up an expectation for me to get stronger and stronger and stronger in my Christian life, then apparently I am working against the attitude that Paul had. Paul said, I'm weak, and when I'm weak, then strangely I'm strong, but it's his power that works within me. And I glory, I brag about my struggles, my weaknesses, my, my inabilities, my issues, um, and so today, it's like we've got this doctrine, we've got this idea that it's, it's like, um, well, it's like the Olympics. It's like physical training for the Olympics. And so you, you know, you train and you get stronger and your muscles get stronger and then you train harder and then you get stronger and you train harder and you look down and you are ripped at this point. And you're telling everybody, look at me, look, check out my guns. Right? Because it's about physical training and your body changes in response to what you're doing and you are improving yourself. And then we take this whole idea and we throw it into church. 
We throw it into church, and then when people aren't strong or can't strengthen themselves, then they wonder why they're the weird ones. Because we set up a false expectation that over time, I'm going to get stronger as a Christian. And yet, what Paul is telling us is, he became acquainted with his weakness, and then he turns to the Ephesian church, and he says, be strong in someone else's strength. So now just follow me. I know that it's hard to put flesh on this. I know that it's hard to tease this out for you and your life. Um, But try to just follow me on this for a second. If you have been encountering failure upon failure and weakness upon weakness, number one, we say, welcome to planet Earth. (laughs) Number two, we say, "God's this is right in God's timing. Don't freak out about it. God isn't shocked at our weakness, our inability to crank out life that looks like Him. Of course you can't crank out life that looks like Him. Imitate Christ? Come on. What are you going to do? When are you going to toss the furniture over? When are you going to walk across water? When are you going to heal blind people with mud? Imitate Christ? Paul says that, sure, but in context he's talking about this attitude of Christ, of dependency. You know, even Jesus, when he walked the earth, he didn't walk the earth in strength. He said, I do nothing of my own accord, but what I see the Father doing, I do. So there's this dependent life. And then, and then the culmination of his ministry is seen in the utter weakness that is brought to the point of death. That is a pitiful ministry in the eyes of the world. This guy was a rock star. He had his disciples... He had his following. He had everybody, you know, saying, what's he going to say next? He had everyone feeding out of his hand. And then he ends up, well, the Romans get him and the Jews get him. And he's hanging on a cross and it's a picture of weakness and death. So all I'm saying is, you know, Paul talks about getting to know the power of Christ. But you know what the phrase before that is? That he would be acquainted with the weaknesses of Christ. So if you're in a place of of, uh, finding yourself drained of your own resources and you're just uh, trying to make the Christian life work and can't figure out how, let me say, first of all, none of us can make the Christian life work. It is not about brain power or willpower. It is about dependency on someone who is not us. And, you know, what creates dependency is urgency. What creates dependency is problems, issues. Otherwise, how in the world are we going to grow in dependency on Jesus if we don't have problems? So sometimes we've got these problems and we're thinking, gosh, it's my fault, it's my problem, I did this to myself, God's doing this to me. you know. And really, the issue is, here's another opportunity to learn dependency through urgency. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Now let's talk about the armor. He says, then put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. So, number one, it's not crazy talk and it's not of a particular denomination or leaning or trendy movement to talk about the enemy. God talks about the enemy right in this verse. Number one, there is an enemy. Number two, he has schemes against us. And yes, that means you. So Paul is talking about our response to this, and he's talking about wearing something. So every day we wake up and we wear something, otherwise we go to prison. So the issue is, what are you going to wear? Right? What are you going to put on? Now, before we get too deep into this, I don't want this to sound like a five-step or a seven-step program Uh, to getting right with God. You got to put on this, you got to put on that, put on this, put on that. Oh my gosh, did I put it all on? Did I leave something out? The point of this is essentially put on Christ. You know, there's other passages that say put on Christ and put on love. So let's keep it simple, but let's see how beautiful Christ is. Watch this. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Oh, man, if I could remember that one. 
Do you ever have uh, issues with anybody that you would regard as a, a human being? <laughs> yeah? So you've had issues with human beings before, and so you then, you, you know, some of these human beings you might even, oh, I don't know, be married to or you have been married to. <laughs> Anyone? Anyone? <laughs> or these human beings, they could be smaller than you, but you gave birth to them. <laughs> or... God forbid, these human beings could be even within the church, in a church building like this, and so there's stuff going on. Family stuff, marriage stuff, church stuff, work stuff, human stuff, right? Well, here's, here's a really cool thought. You know, we're, we're designed to be motivated by someone. From the beginning, in the garden, we were designed to be motivated by someone. There's always something behind our motivation. There's a thought, a belief, sometimes an accusation, an enemy, condemnation. So, you know, if you find yourself in a situation where you feel like you're under attack, you might just be under attack. And I don't mean that you go and you, you know lay in your bedroom and you start getting out crucifixes and waving them around your house or, you know, pouring holy beads over your living room or anything like that. I just made that up. Yeah, it did not work for me. I'm not saying you go fanatical um, in response to this, but I think Paul is saying, number one, we have an enemy. Number two, he's an accuser and he launches, he hurls things at us. And there is a response for us to take, and it has something to do with what we wear. All right? So, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It may feel like it. It may seem like it. Uh, but there is an enemy, and uh, just beware. But against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. So this is talking about Satan, the devil, it said in the previous verse. Um, and so, you know, it's interesting because I feel like there's sort of two extremes that Christians have gone to, right? Number one, the devil is under every bush, right? Devil, 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 devil. You ask somebody how they're doing, uh, well, I'm, you know, I'm totally condemned by the devil. Uh, how you doing now? Well, you know, the devil's really after me. Uh, well, how you doing now? Well, you know, the devil has uh, stolen everything in my home. Uh, the devil has sent uh, burglars to, you know, uh, just totally rip me off. You know, we have people in this, in this congregation who've, um, who've had their belongings taken. And so you could look at that and you could say, the devil's after me, the devil's after me. The devil's under every bush. Now, the opposite of that is, oh, it's 2013, we've got technology. See, we've got the Internet now, so there is no devil. <laughs> We're so modern, and we've got our science and our understanding, and so, you know, we're just, it's just too ancient of a belief to believe in an enemy that's archaic, that's old, there's no such thing as the devil. So you've got these two extremes, and then you've got, it seems like you've got what we're talking about today. There is an enemy. You don't have to give him your attention. You can shift your attention away from him and put on Christ, but there is an enemy, so be aware. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. You know, a few weeks ago I talked about, you know, those comedians and they stand on stage and sometimes when they're really bad, the fruit starts, the fruit starts getting hurled and they start having to dodge celery and tomatoes and apples and oranges and all kinds of things. You know, and yet their job at least is to stand firm and go ahead. Uh, and so, you know, this is sort of a picture of all the stuff that gets hurled at us. Your track record gets hurled at you. Your track record gets hurled at you. And you can't stop it from being hurled. You can only dodge it and keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. The trial's over. The verdict was guilty. The punishment was death. Jesus died. He took the punishment in full. There's nothing left to be done about your sins, and yet the fruit can still be hurled at you because of the accuser. 
So he's saying here, watch out, stand firm, dodge the fruit, and by the way, you can wear some protective armor, and we'll talk about that next. The belt of truth. This comes up first. Um, we talk a lot about truth. You know, some people talk a lot about uh, casting out demons and, uh, um, you know, uh, exorcisms and that sort of thing. And what we talk a lot about is truth. That truth is the response to deception. That truth is the answer when accusation comes. Because accusation is a lie and truth is what Jesus did in response to our sins. So think about a truth encounter. When you think about the enemy operating in your life and what the remedy is, the remedy is not a bunch of fanatical stuff. Did you notice that after the cross, I'm just going to throw this out there. It doesn't mean I have all the answers about this, but I'm going to throw this out there. That for all the casting out of demons that Christians do in the world today, there is not a single verse about casting out demons in any epistle of the New Testament. You would think that if this were a regular thing that Christians should do, that Paul or Peter or James or John would instruct somebody about like how to do it on a regular basis, the church guide to casting out demons. All I'm saying is this, casting out or praying or not praying, you know, the bottom line is, is that the enemy has a message. The enemy is not just a presence, there's a message attached. And the message is, you're guilty, you're dirty, you're distant, you're not good enough, you don't qualify. And Jesus has a message, and it's, I have qualified you. And the truth is, you're clean, and you're close, and you're qualified, and you're okay. So the question is then, what, what belt am I going to wear here? The belt of truth or the belt of deception? And the breastplate of righteousness, we'll talk about that in a minute. He says, stand firm, therefore, that's front and center, fixing your eyes on Jesus, standing firm, feet planted, foundation is Jesus Christ, dodging the fruit, because it's coming, fixing your eyes on Jesus, girding your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate. Man, that's where you get hit hard, right here, right, in battle, this is, where, this is the number one spot they're aiming for. It's your heart. If they can get your heart, you're out of commission. Your head is a good target. It's harder to hit. This is your core. If we can get you in the heart, you're done. Now, why is it that he calls this piece righteousness? You know what righteousness is? Righteousness is, I am okay. That's what righteousness is. And you know what the darts are saying? You're not okay. You're not okay. You're not okay. You're not okay. You are not okay. And here's why you're not okay. And let me pull out the file drawer and tell you why you're not okay. Because you've committed the unpardonable. You've committed too many. God's fed up with you. God's sick of you. God's tired of you. You are not okay. And so there's a simple thought that comes from the gospel. And that is... You're, you're more than okay. Don't miss it. You are way more than okay. You are the righteousness of God. So the enemy says you're a four because one won't work. One, telling you you're a one out of ten, puts you in utter depression, which then gets you to people that will help you. <laughs> so the enemy doesn't want to convince you that you're a one. Because when you're that desperate and that low, you will find yourself in a community of helpers and you will get aid. It's much more deceptive, it's much more subtle, it's much more effective to tell you that you're a four, not a one. Or maybe even to let you linger in the area of six. And then we start getting a hold of the gospel and we start thinking, you know, I might just be an eight. Yeah, I'm actually forgiven of all my sins, a lot of sins, but I'm forgiven, so I might be an eight. Meanwhile, heaven is shouting, you're an 11. You're an 11. Way more than a 10. The righteousness of God. So don't miss it because it's so awesome. Sometimes it's so awesome, we just can't believe that it's that good, and so we're willing to settle for the land of eight. So he talks about our righteousness here. The darts are coming. 
The weapons are aimed. They're launched right at us. The accusation, the temptation. Here's the, the one-two punch. Arrow one, get this now. You've experienced this. Maybe not in these words, but you've, you've been through it. Number one, the arrow of temptation. Then you look down, and there's the arrow of accusation that just comes in. Thump. I can't believe you were tempted by that. I can't believe you thought that. What kind of Christian? So temptation and then accusation for having the temptation. Have you ever found the thoughts swirling in your head and you're like, what is wrong with me? Here's a newsflash. Every time those thoughts hit us, it is yet another reminder that, yeah, there's a power called sin, but I am not sin. I am not sin. I am not the source of those thoughts. The Bible says, consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God. That means there's something called sin, but guess what? You are not it. Pornography. People get enslaved to pornography. A lot of men, even, dare I say, women. Yeah, I've looked it up on the internet. It's true. <laughs> so we've got these thoughts that are hurled at us, and then we start thinking, gosh, why am I being tempted by this? I'm an awful person, I'm an awful person, I'm an awful person. So the temptation is quickly followed by the accusation, isn't it? And then you live in the accusation, and then you get to the point where you say, well, gosh, I guess I might as well just do it. I mean, it's all I, you know, it's all I seem to be thinking about all day long, so I might as well just do it. Because that's who I am, apparently. I'm already guilty of thinking the thoughts, so I might as well do the deeds. See where the enemy's got you? I'm already guilty of thinking the thoughts. I might as well. Now, did Jesus get the thoughts? Did you hear what I said? Did you hear what I asked? Did Jesus get the thoughts? Because if you don't think he did, then you don't think Jesus was tempted. What is temptation if the thoughts don't arrive? The thoughts have to arrive for it to be temptation. It is not a sin to be tempted. And even if you do go through with something and you find yourself feeling those awful, dirty, distant feelings, get this, the gospel means you're forgiven. You really are forgiven. And so this righteousness thing becomes a really big deal, guys. It's more than being cleansed of your unrighteousness and turned into some eight. It's that you've been given the righteousness of God. Now, I used an extreme example that might hit some men in the room, but there's a lot of ways this plays out in our lives. Bitterness in a marriage. Man, he just ticks me off over and over and over. He never thinks of me. He never does for me. You know, he never, he never, and we latch on to the thoughts and then we entertain them, and next thing you know, we've projected. Nobody does this, right? This is just me. <laughs> you ever projected? You know what I mean? We're projecting into the next day, the next week, the next month about what it's all going to look like. And the movie is always a horror film. It's never pretty. And so we just keep watching the movie. <laughs> and then we're all stressed out. We're grabbing the hand rests. We're freaking out. Next thing you know, he comes over and sits down next to us, and we just lash out at him. And he's like, what are you even talking about? Didn't you see the movie? Projection. The enemy has a heyday with that. Notice what the enemy's weapons are, past and future. You see that? Drum up your past or get you to project into your future. And the only answer to that is to live in now. Because what did God call himself? I am. I am. Sure, I'm going to be, and I was, but for you right now, I am. So let's live in I am. So now watch then that the enemy, basically all those strategies can be summed up with a focus on the past or a focus on an unforeseen future. 
And sometimes the hardest thing for us is just to live in the now and say, yeah, he is, I am. So the next it says, the feet shod with the gospel of peace. Having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. This means wherever you go as a believer, that the, the goal in, in, in believing in the gospel and even talking about the gospel is not to stir up a fight. But you know, we can do this in the grace community or whatever. We can do this as good as anybody, right? You walk up to somebody and say, hey, uh, do you know you don't even have to ask forgiveness for your sins? <laughs> See you later. <laughs> and we try to stir that up, right? Nobody's ever done this. This is just me. Now, the other thing you can do is you just... Uh, you know, you just argue and argue and debate and argue and everybody's inflamed and angry and nobody gets anything out of it and you walk away and all you've had is basically a verbal fist fight over who's right and who knows the most about the Bible. <laughs> That's not on God's agenda. It's funny because, you know, I mean, I've done, I've done all those things and, you know, sometimes I might continue to do them. And yet the result is the same. The result is the same every time. So apparently, here's a crazy idea. The gospel is actually designed to help people when they want help. And that's what it's to be used for. To help people when they want help. So that means that they have to want help. As I've described it before, right? The grace in your face approach, just sh shoving grace. Let's get you the new covenant right now. <laughs> Good luck with that. So, you know, they have to want help. They have to need help and they have to want help. So the preparation of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, in addition to all taking up the shield of faith, with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Does this sound like there might be one in doubt? You get hit, oh, I didn't see that one coming. I'm not prepared for this one. There's no answer to this one. Does it sound like that's the situation? It says extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. So that means whatever has, you've been toying around with in your head that you think is just going to be a lifelong struggle mentally, a lifelong struggle spiritually, a lifelong struggle with guilt or condemnation or accusation, a lifelong struggle, you'll never be able to live it, live it, um, live it away or, or you'll never be able to live it down, you'll never be able to um, make up for it. The answer is you're not supposed to make up for it. You could never make up for it. It's despicable, it's awful, it's called sin, but Jesus died. It was a despicable death. He paid for it in full, and it's over. And that's the answer, not making up for it, not living it down, not trying to do better next time in hopes that it'll be erased. So the shield of faith, you know, I've talked uh, recently about fueling up. This is what the shield of faith means to me. You get the input, you fuel up on the truth, and you just, you just decide this stuff is right. This stuff makes sense. You look at the work of Jesus and you say, wow. And then you say, thank you. And that's what faith is. Faith is not some you know, thing that we're supposed to drum up over here. And when we have enough of it, we're going to have perfect health and perfect wealth and all that stuff. Faith, you've already got faith. The Bible says that to each person there's been a portion to measure of faith. You've got faith, you've got faith, you've got faith, you've got all the faith you need. The question is, where are you going to point it? So when you point it at Jesus Christ and you say, His death took away all my sins, not some of them. His resurrection gave me perfect unity with Him, not distance and separation. When I point my faith at that thought and I say, wow, okay, awesome, Thank you, that's faith, and we're done. It's not complicated. Everybody right now has faith in something. You might have faith in the idea that you're a four. That's faith. You, you believe currently that you're a four on God's scale. That's faith. It takes faith to believe that. You are putting faith in the accusation you've received. So then you have a choice, put faith in accusation... Or put faith in the work of Jesus, and the choice is ours. The helmet of salvation, 
the sword of the Spirit. Now notice where the, the salvation is. It's on your head. Because we get the thoughts about our salvation. You know how many Christians I've met that struggle with, am I truly saved? Have I lost my salvation? Am I really saved? What does it feel like to be saved? Let me tell you what it feels like. It feels like a Monday. <laughs> and then it feels like a Tuesday, and then it feels like a Wednesday. That's what it feels like. Oh, no, but I've heard these people feel. Yeah, well, they feel it for four minutes during a worship song, and they tell everybody about it, and then they go home to a Monday and a Tuesday, and our feelings are all over the place. And John, the Apostle John, writes this, and he says, I write you these things so that you may know that you have eternal life. Not feel it, know it. So the helmet of salvation, I'm not saying it's a feelingless life. I'm not saying you don't feel anything. I feel all kinds of wonderful things. And then I also feel all kinds of horrible things. And then I also feel some... Some really just some medium stuff. You know, right in the middle. I feel everything. You feel everything? Thank God it's not about what you feel. The helmet of salvation. Notice that it's on the head because the thoughts are there. How many Christians struggle with am I saved? What does it feel like to be saved? Um, am I really saved? I, I've never met a Christian that didn't have that thought at one point or another. I mean, to me, you wouldn't even be human if you didn't doubt uh, about where you're at with God. It's healthy to question that to some degree, isn't it? But the gospel is designed to firm things up. The gospel is designed to give us a rock-solid foundation that cannot be penetrated. So the gospel is, is not saying you're 90% forgiven, it's 100. The gospel is not saying you're 90% righteous, it's 100. So it's impenetrable if we really understand it. And that's why you've got to draw a line in the sand here. And you don't flirt with an 8 or a 4, you say it's 0 or 10. Because 8s don't go to heaven, they don't. Eights are not acceptable in heaven. And apparently you're raised and seated in heaven already, so you can't be an eight. Right. So you're zero or ten, and you draw a line, and you say, I'm unforgiven or totally forgiven. I'm unrighteous or I'm the righteousness of God. I'm God's righteousness. I'm either totally distant and dirty or I'm 100% clean and close, and there is no gray area. You pick your side of the line, and you live from it. And it's got to be black and white like this. The enemy wants you to walk on this tightrope right in the middle. That's what the enemy's trying to do. Get you to compromise and mix and blend and have a balance. We'll call this humility. I'm all for genuine humility. Genuine humility is, I didn't deserve this. It's a totally a gift. There's nothing I could have done to impress God. But there's another side, a flip side to humility, and that is where I take it, I receive it, I say thank you, and I own it. Amen. Real humility is saying the same thing that God says about you, no more and no less. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You know, we, we joke all the time about, uh, you know, people that are counting their minutes in their quiet time and oh my gosh I've done my duty now I feel righteous and all that stuff but jokes aside about trying to earn acceptance with God man every week we're looking at, at this and it's the word of God and it is fuel and it is awesome and uh, you think I was talking to a guy last night he was talking about how his church is consumed with spiritual disciplines to the point that everybody feels so bad about not doing all these spiritual disciplines that it's actually had the opposite effect there's been so much preaching about spiritual discipline I hope you don't even know what the spiritual disciplines are do you if you don't that's a good sign uh, that maybe we're on the right track because God does not talk about prayer as a spiritual discipline or Bible study as a spiritual discipline it's, it's your father that you're talking to. Imagine my father 
uh, you know, he, he's, he lives with me and he loves me and he cares about me. And then I say to him, yeah, I've just got to have enough discipline to talk to you. I wish I had enough discipline to talk to you. That's an insult to him, man. If he loves me and he's my dad, why wouldn't I want to talk to him? And so instead of getting the idea that I need to check things off in a disciplined fashion, I need to get acquainted with who this guy is and what he thinks about me. Same thing with, uh, with Bible study here. We're not doing this out of discipline. I'd say we're doing this out of desperation. <laughs> I know that's why I'm doing it. I don't have any answers besides pushing this button and seeing what the next verse says. There are no answers that I just sort of try to make up out of my head here. If I do, I, I'm an idiot. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God, and that's the offensive weapon. That's the only offensive weapon mentioned. So it's truth, 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 slicing and dicing all those thoughts apart. They will not stand. Oh, and lastly, there's this thing called prayer that Paul wraps up with. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. What does that mean? In the Spirit. Oh my gosh, i got to pray in the Spirit. Never done that before. I guess I should take an in the Spirit class to figure out how to pray in the Spirit. The Bible tells us that you don't belong to Jesus unless you're in the Spirit. The Bible tells us in Romans that if you don't have the Spirit of God, you don't belong to Him. And if anyone is in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. If he's not in Christ Jesus, he's not a new creation. So the good news is every single new creation in this room is in Christ. And every single new creation in this room is in the Spirit. So if you're going to pray, you got to pray in the Spirit. What does Paul mean here? In agreement with in accord with, in line with. You know, it's like um, ask anything in my name and it'll happen. Well, God, you know, I pray for a Lamborghini a Diablo. I'd like it to be in black with a white stripe. It didn't work. I guess that verse is wrong. Well, no, what does it mean to pray in his name? Pray in accordance with his heart. If I represent his name, you know... If I'm an ambassador and I go to Africa and I say I'm an ambassador for the United States and they've given me 25 pages in a folder with their agenda for me to share with Africa and I, on the plane ride over there I pull out a napkin and start scribbling out my own agenda and when I get there I read from the napkin and go home, have I, have I spoken in the name of the United States of America? No, I've spoken in my own name, not in accordance with their agenda that they had planned out for me. So there's a, a prayer of gimme, 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 gimme. Fix all my circumstances. Give me comfort. Give me pleasure. Give me no problems. Take planet earth away. And that is called a prayer according to the flesh. Fix everything I experience, please, God. You know, there'd be a line out the door if those prayers were coming true. People would be flooding in here to figure out how to say the magic words so that all the hard stuff would go away. But that's not what praying in the Spirit is. Praying in the Spirit is, is you look at the will of God. What is it? Christ in me. What is the will of God? Christ through me. What is the will of God? Salvation for the Jew and Gentile. What is the will of God? That we bear much fruit. What is the will of God? That none perish but all believe. What is the will of God from actually looking at the Word of God? The will of God is Christ in people, then Christ through people. Salvation and fruit being born. Life the life of Christ in people and through people. And as I pray in accordance to that about the gospel getting out, about me growing in Christ, about others growing in Christ, about people being exposed to truth, I'm praying, and, and, and my, I might even pray something like, I know if I get really weird, I might even pray something like, thank you for this difficult circumstance and what it's teaching me. I don't mean that you hurled it at me, God. I don't mean that. I don't believe you hurled this at me as some cruel dictator up in heaven throwing frisbees of difficulty at people. But I do think that you've got a plan even in this. And I thank you. Pray and petition. Pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints... All the saints, people around you, pray for other people even. I mean, 
Wow, there's a thought, right? And pray on my behalf, Paul's saying, gosh, pray for me, would you? That utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. For which I am an ambassador in chains, sitting in prison at times, that is, that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Well, what do we see today? Breastplate of righteousness, sword of the spirit, shield of faith, helmet of salvation, the belt of truth and the feet shod with the gospel of peace. In other words, God's got you covered. The gospel means you're covered. Now, as you look at the other point, not just the pieces of it, but look over here. Let's keep this simple. It's not about six steps to spiritual freedom. There's one step. Who is righteousness? Jesus. Who is the spirit? Paul says he's the spirit of Christ, Jesus. Faith, faith in who? Jesus. Salvation, salvation from where? From Jesus. The truth, the truth about who? About Jesus. The gospel of peace, what's that gospel all about? Jesus. In other words, put on the full armor of God, put on Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the simple truth that uh, we get thoughts and not all of them are from us. And those thoughts require a response. Sometimes the answer is simply to ignore. To ignore and fix our eyes on something totally different. Ignore error. Fix our eyes on truth. Set our minds on things that are actually real, not fantasy, not fiction, not projection into the future. Father, I, I want to pray right now for each and every person here individually. I want to pray for a married couples. I just want to pray that uh, we would all not only see our identity in Christ, but that you would give us the eyes to see our spouse's identity in Christ, their true motives, their heart, their good heart toward us because you've given them a good heart. I pray for those that have conflicts in the workplace, conflicts at home, conflicts with children. I just pray, Father, that you might give us the discernment in our thought lives to look at everything through this grid of who we are, who you've made us to be, and where the thoughts are really coming from. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and stand with us. Can everyone see what he has done? He has lifted us. He has overcome the power of the grave and the sin that was enslaved. Can hold him in the ground, it couldn't keep him down. Rise with a shout, cry out, our God's alive. One thought, and that is that every day I get dressed. Every day you get dressed. And the question is, what are you going to put on? So when you wake up in the morning, what thoughts are you going to put on? What are you going to be willing to live with? Are you willing to live with the idea that you're a four? Are you going to surrender to the idea that you're an eight? Or are you going to fix your eyes on Jesus Christ and say, He made me a ten? And I thank him, and I receive it, and I own it, and I live from it. Have a great day.